So I'm going to talk today about um, my journey in, in finding my place in the climate movement. Um, I've been connected with nature from a very young age in a very deep way. Um, I would say people in my life would probably describe my affinity for trees as annoying. Um, <laughs> so I'm happy to talk about that later in the Q&A. Uh, but uh, I, I grew up in, in Queens, New York, um, but close to a, a big park that had a, a, a wonderful web of life. And I was constantly in that park exploring that web of life. Uh, in more recent history was when my climate journey began. And I would say before I became activated in starting in 2014, I was environmentally engaged, but I probably wasn't doing the right things in hindsight. Um, so this is kind of a, an overview of, of my climate action journey. And it started by learning to see. Um, and what I did in 2014, I joined an organization called Artworks for Change. Uh, and the mission of the organization is to address critical social and environmental issues through traveling art exhibitions and storytelling projects. And uh, I really didn't want to deal with any of the logistics of a traveling exhibition. So I decided that I would curate an environmental exhibition and create a, a virtual museum mm -hmm. online. And so that's what I did. Um, and through that process, I curated the exhibition and was immersed in the subject matter for quite some period of time. And that immersion gave me a perspective on climate change that I did not have before. Uh, and so I'm going to try through the slideshow to share some of that experience with you through some of the art that I curated into the exhibition. Um, and once you learn to see in the context of climate change, then you need to quickly move on to learning to solve because at that point you're kind of in what we call emergency mode. Uh, you're, you're thinking about solving a problem because you realize that your pants are on fire and that's probably an appropriate response is to move with some sense of urgency. So you start learning about solutions and some of those solutions are uh, technological and, and behavioral and some of those solutions are uh, policy bridges to make those uh, solutions a reality. So you learn to solve. And then finally, uh, uh, what Harita spoke to so eloquently and, and as did Jonathan is, you know, how do we go about finding our place in the climate movement once we have a clear picture of what needs to be done collectively? Uh, and so that was my journey. It was really this three-part uh, journey toward trying to figure things out. Um, so learning to see, I put this uh, in here for Mo because Mo has great sense of humor and, uh, and loves data and science. And, and this kind of tells the story about uh, emissions. We've got an emissions problem um, and those emissions are reaching uh, unprecedented uh, levels and uh, they've, they've surpassed unprecedented levels in human history. Um, and so the first thing we need to see are the consequences. So here, uh, a clever artwork installed on a beach in, in uh, Australia. We're seeing these consequences in our daily lives, and we will continue to see them uh, into the future. Heat waves, we're seeing uh, wildfires. In this artwork, Juliette de Moss took one of her drawings and she set it on fire. And then she set about the process of trying to stitch it back together with thread. So. This is a metaphor for an approach to climate change where we just say, you know what, we'll just deal with the consequences as they unfold. Um, not the easiest thing to do. So if you don't believe me, try doing this project in the safety of your own home, maybe in your bathroom, where you can quickly put it out. Uh, we've also dealt with historic drought, um, where we're seeing storm activity. Uh, and, and that storm activity, unprecedented rainfall is, is close to home. So I was surprised when I put this together, how many of these manifestations of climate change I personally have experienced recently living here, which is shocking. Um, we're also seeing people displaced by climate change, whether it's fires or floods. Uh, this, we're, we're going to produce a whole generation of, of climate refugees. Um, 
we also need to see beyond our own horizons, right? So here we see uh, beautiful photography from uh, a person who's a, a fine artist, but also a polar explorer. Uh, on the left, you see uh, a beautiful iceberg. So these are created when ice breaks off of an ice shelf in, in uh, the Arctic or Antarctic in, in a polar region. Um, and then on the right, you're seeing sea ice, which is when, uh, when ocean water freezes uh, in, in the polar regions. Well, both, of, uh, both land ice and sea ice have an effect of reflecting uh, the sun's energy back into space. And so the more that ice melts, the less reflection takes place. And so we call that a feedback loop. And as that feedback loop continues to generate ice melt, then we get sea level rise. Uh, so in this beautiful painting by Alexis Rockman, uh, we see uh, a, a vision of the Brooklyn waterfront 200 years in the future. The problem is that might, that might be too far in the future. I mean, this might happen actually sooner. Uh, Alexis Rockman uh, is a good example of someone who uh, aligned his passions. He grew up in a household where his mother worked at the Museum of Natural History in, in New York. And he was uh, interested in painting, specifically the Hudson School of Landscape Painters. And so he combined the two disciplines into these dramatic landscape paintings that address kind of our stress, our, our stressed relationship with the natural world. Um, in addition to sea level rise, the, the temperature and acidity of the oceans is also changing as we continue to warm the planet. And that's going to unfortunately lead to die off of, of coral in, in large quantities. Um, we also need to see behind the curtain. And what do I mean by that? Uh, so here we see a land art piece by uh, artist Chris Drury. And the story behind this is very interesting, the artwork itself. So here he took um, pine trees in the state of Wyoming that died off from pine beetle infestations. And pine beetles uh, are thriving because the climate is warming and it's allowing those pests to thrive and destroy these beautiful uh, ancient forests. And then in between the seams, uh, the artist has put coal, which is the flip side of, of Wyoming, the coal mining, which is contributing to this and creating this vortex, this visual association of, of uh, spiraling down uh, makes this a very powerful artwork. But the legacy of this artwork is not what you would think because this was installed at the University of Wyoming and on the board of the University of Wyoming or were some very powerful people from the coal industry. So over the course of a day or two, they got annoyed that this installation was in place and it was gone. It was whisked away without a trace. And so what we're seeing behind the curtain are people, companies, organizations with a lot of money invested in the perpetuation of fossil fuel use. And that's a problem. And we need to mobilize because we can't assume that everyone is on the same page about climate change. Some people are still interested in lining their, their pockets. We also need to begin to see the forest for the trees. So in this work by Chris Jordan, um, we see a pointillist painting uh, recreated but here, all of the pixels are little aluminum, images of aluminum cans and a specific number of them. He used 106,000 images of aluminum cans, which represented the number used in the US every 30 seconds. This was back in 2007. Um, so that's really profound. And sometimes these large numbers, when we think about, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get a Coke uh, and then toss the can, what, what's the big deal with that? Well, the big deal is that there are 8 billion people, nearly 8 billion people on the planet. And so the, these numbers get large pretty quickly and we can pretty quickly wind up in a state of overshoot. Namely, we're, we're overshooting the earth's resources. So as we begin to immerse ourselves in this information about climate change, then we start to see the causes. We start to see the dynamic that Jonathan described where, uh, where we're, able to extract resources and pollute without paying the true social cost of that. And that has consequences. We have moved from uh, indigenous peoples uh, living in a symbiotic way with the, with the environment to an extractive economy where we are cutting down forests. Uh, I read an article a couple of years ago about how the Charmin uh, toilet paper sold at Costco 
is produced by cutting down ancient forests in Canada. Like, is that really necessary? Is that productive? That, that doesn't seem to be necessary or productive. Strip mining in this beautiful painting by Chester Arnold uh, to extract coal, uh, the, the way we move around, the transportation infrastructure. So this is systems level stuff, right? So we may look at behaviors in our own household, but we need to act at a level where we can start influencing this because this leads to landscapes, extractive landscapes that are outside of our field of vision, but they exist. And if you get to a point where you can see these things, you begin to see that they, they trace back to us and the choices that we're making and the systems that we allow to exist. So in this beautiful work, it's a shadow work where the artists took, collected their own trash and set it up. So Mo, maybe this is a project for, uh, for, the, for the parents, right? Make the parents do this. Um, but this, this amazing self-portrait with our own trash. We, we live in a, a society where we're still dominated by single-use products and, and single-use packaging. And you know, we send it to the landfill and it's out of sight, out of mind, but it's not gone. It's there for a thousand years. Uh, it's leaking into our water streams and winding up in our, the fish that we eat. Um, and then our, our, our land use practices associated with agriculture. Animal agriculture is a massive source of emissions. Uh, growing a single plant like corn, row after row after row, saps the ability of the soil to sequester carbon. Right? We started with a beautiful video about soil, but what are we actually doing? What we're actually doing are these mega farms that are producing corn in massive amounts that we're feeding to uh, you know, uh, factory farmed animals. It's, it's not a healthy relationship to the natural world and we're, we're seeing the consequences. So all of this adds up to a picture where we start to feel anxious, right? And we have to say, do we see our own blind spots as a species? Uh, are we going to launch ourselves headlong into this repeating pattern of walking up to the cliff's edge and, and walking over it? Um, I love this work by Lori Nix and Kathleen Gerber. Uh, it's called Control Room, uh, but it's kind of a dystopian post-human scene. And you look at it and you're like, okay, that's kind of an interesting picture. I wonder where this is. Uh, and, and it's actually an illusion. It's a table-sized diorama that the artists produce uh, paint stroke by paint stroke all by hand, and then they photograph it. Um, and for me, it's a very powerful reminder that we operate under this illusion of control. We think that climate change is this thing that we can just turn mm -hmm. on and off as we, as we desire, but it's not actually the case. We reach tipping points faster than we expect, we set in motion warming that can't be reversed. We set in motion changes in the environment that can't be reversed. And so the final piece of this is, is learning to see the whole picture. So this artist, this is an amazing pro uh, project by uh, an artist named Memo Akton, who's from Turkey. And what he did is he wanted to, uh, he, he train. it's called training a computer. It's computer learning. So it's a form of artificial intelligence where he fed images, uh, tens of thousands of images of specific scenes to a computer. And then he created, and then he set up a webcam. And so the, the computer is gonna take input in from the webcam and then translate what it's seeing into what it has experienced to date. It has a, a, a context for, uh, for what it has experienced to date. And so the, the, uh, the project's called Learning to See and the webcam input is on the left. And in this first series, the computer has been trained uh, through tens of thousands of images from Flickr on ocean scenes. So the manipulation on the left being taken in by the uh, webcam is being translated into what the computer knows, which is the ocean scene. So it's this uh, amazing new media artwork that becomes a metaphor for our our what we are learning from what we are seeing. When will we start connecting the small decisions and choices we make in our lives to these profound impacts on the natural world, whether that's the oceans or later in the video, 
uh, he switches over to fire. So I, I find this a, a beautiful project to kind of sum up this stage of, of learning to see. Uh, now, the good news is that once we see all of this, then we can move on to solutions. So this is not my favorite solution, <laughs> building an arc. But, uh, but again, it's, it's when, when we start that, the conversation about what needs to happen, we talk about um, the, the, the scientists. What are the scientists telling us? The scientists are telling us through the IPCC reports uh, that we have to limit global warming to one and a half degrees centigrade. Otherwise, it's going to be bedlam. <laughs> and no one wants the kind of bedlam that scientists worry about. Uh, well, what do we need to accomplish that? We need to cut emissions in half by 2030, and then we need to get to net zero by 2050. Um, it's, a, it's a heavy lift. I'm not, I'm not going to mislead you. But the good news is that we have solutions. We have uh, Project Drawdown uh, was originated locally by Paul Hawken, and it reviews the top 80 or so solutions to climate change. These are all existing technologies. We don't need to come up with things that don't exist today. These are existing technologies. We've all seen wind turbines. We've all seen solar farms. So the only difference between where we are today and piecing together a portfolio of technological solutions to solve this problem is the process of scaling them up, right? So I decided as part of my art, art journey to create a series of artworks that uh, conveyed the project drawdown solutions as, as a conversation starter. And I'm beginning to incorporate these artworks into games. So on the left here, you see solar farms. On the right, you see uh, uh, offshore, uh, onshore wind. Uh, and so there's a whole series of energy solutions in project drawdown. And I encourage you, if you have never seen this research project to go online and just Look at it because it's a very hopeful message. They're saying, we have the technologies, we can do this. On the left is food waste, right? We control food waste. We can make changes in our individual lives. We can make systemic changes. On the right, plant-based diets. That's something we can control in our households. Um, on the left, these are land uses. This is restoring uh, temperate forests. On the right, protecting and restoring wetlands. Again, these are solutions that are within our power. We just need to make them a political priority for ourselves. So how do we, how do we deploy solutions that need a little help to get some scale? You need smart policies. And that's where groups like Citizens Climate Lobby and other groups that are advocating for national scale climate solutions are so impactful. Um, so that brings me to the final chapter in my journey, which is, how to find your place in the climate movement. So for me, there was a long period of time where I wanted to work on activism, but I'd feel bad that I wasn't working on my art. And then if I was working on my art, I'd feel guilty that I wasn't working on my climate activism. And I didn't feel a sense of fulfillment until I aligned the two. And so since, about, since several years ago, I've been designing games and artworks as conversation starters for conversations like this that open people up by communicating through channels that uh, get past some of the defenses, some of the walls that we put up. Um, we created a, a tool and, and this tool, this is my personal climate action portfolio. Uh, I've got stuff going on in our house. I've got stuff going on in our community through local groups. I'm part of Sustainable Mill Valley. I'm on the City of Mill Valley's Climate Action Plan Update Task Force. I've been getting involved at the school. And then I've got national stuff. And um, Jen and Ashley are gonna talk to you about you know, what portfolio of actions this community can get involved in because we need to roll up our sleeves. There's room for everyone in the climate movement and we need every person. So how do we succeed in, in finding our place? Align your climate work with your priorities and passions. So I'm working with young people who need to find a job so um, I connect them with environmental organizations that are doing data work, get them experience learning Excel, and then they get to put that on the resume and it helps them get a job, but they're also doing something that's important to them relating to the climate. Um, 
Be a contributor, leverage your skills and resources. If you have a law degree, there's a place for you in the climate movement. There's lots of policy stuff. There's lots of ways to leverage your skills and your resources. If you wanna write checks, that's also good. The climate movement needs money. Um, be an influencer, leverage your networks and platforms. You're gonna hear from Ashley and Jen, they are leveraging their platform at this school to spread the word. And that's what we can all do. We're all part of organizations. We're all part of community groups. We're all, we all have family members. We all have crazy uncles and aunts who maybe don't understand climate science. And we can be an influencer on those platforms.